To provide more context for these various stages, we will share our own experiences navigating Helms' schema. We will describe moments in our racial identity development and link them to one or more particular stages. Jenna's story. For me, the contact stage did not last very long. I lived in a predominantly white neighborhood in Charlottesville, Virginia. Though the city has a large black population, I lived in an almost entirely white neighborhood, attended a predominantly white church, and went to a preschool that was also predominantly white. I would not have been able to articulate at such a young age ideas such as being colorblind, but I certainly started to hear those messages. Though my parents were activists of a kind, they still believed that to talk about race was racist, so we didn't very often, except in an exoticized way with an almost envious tone, a black culture in particular. Later, my parents chose to send my sister and I to the local public school, which was one of the very last schools in the country to desegregate. It was my elementary school experience that propelled me into disintegration. I am not certain of the racial makeup of the students, but when I attended Venable in 1974, there were two faculty members of color, including my recently immigrated Japanese music teacher in whose class we learned the cotton-picking song Jump Down, Turn Around, Pick a Bale of Cotton. The rest of the teachers were white. I started having black classmates and friends, and on occasion, I would go on playdates to their houses. I had never seen this part of town before, and the neighborhoods were almost entirely black. The houses were smaller, and there was trash in the streets. At school, though I'm certain I could not have articulated it, I understood on some level that the expectations for me and my other white classmates were different than for my black classmates. I cannot make sense of these disparities that clearly fell along racial lines. I went into this highly racially charged environment every day, but had no vocabulary, scaffolding, context, or discussion about what I was experiencing. My well-intentioned liberal parents and an integrated school were not enough to prevent racial stereotypes. In the absence of information, I had to rely on what was available to me, media messages, racial lies, and myths, to make sense of the world I was seeing, and I reintegrated. By about the age of seven, I started to believe that black families and kids must not care about education the way that mine did, that black neighborhoods existed because they chose it, and that they didn't work as hard as white people. I started only playing with the other white students and started unconsciously believing in my own racial superiority, though I had been taught to say things like, everyone is equal. I even began to fear black people outside of school. I cannot pinpoint a specific transition to starting to create a non-racist identity for myself. I dipped into being curious about the racial disparities I knew existed. I cared about my friends of color, and I certainly wanted to believe myself to be one of the good white people. I also know that I reintegrated any time I felt challenged, embarrassed, or ill-informed, and avoided talking directly about race with my friends of color. I went to a small liberal arts college and wrote my thesis about homelessness and was never once asked to consider how race played a factor in housing security. I went to graduate school to get a master's in cross-cultural education and was only required to take one diversity class. I student taught in the Los Angeles school district and was never prompted, compelled, or questioned to consider either my race nor that of my students. Later, I did prevention and education work for a domestic violence agency, and it was there that I started to understand sexism as systemic and institutional power. Through this, I started to get a foundational understanding of racism, heterosexism, classism, and all isms as systems. While my understanding was intellectual and disconnected from my own life, I had enough of an understanding to be dangerous. I became deeply entrenched in the self-righteousness of pseudo-independence. Not only did I distance myself from other white people who I thought didn't get it, I also tried to hide parts of myself that seemed too white, like my British father and the British culture that was part of my upbringing. I thought my experiences and my good intentions gave me an authority and even a responsibility to point out and shame the lack of understanding that other white people had about racial injustice. I called this my wokest white woman phase. 
Later, when I became a teacher, I set about fixing the kids of color. I thought it was about helping students of color achieve and being a good white person. It wasn't until several years later when I was teaching my then favorite book, To Kill a Mockingbird, that I became aware of how delusional this belief was. I had prepared some amazing lessons and believed I was taking on racism head on. I sat my students down on the floor in a circle so we could have a real discussion about racism. During my meticulously planned lesson, a black student in my class stood up and walked out of the room. She was shaking. And when I asked her what was wrong, she said that the lesson was making her a little uncomfortable. Now, this really is such a mild interruption of my whiteness, but it did not feel small at the time. I was upset. I dissolved into tears with my colleagues. Instead of hearing and seeing what was going on for my student, I made this about me. Didn't she understand that I was trying to help her by talking about racism? Truthfully, I was probably even a little angry. She should be grateful for all the ways I was fighting injustice in my classroom. Eventually, I was able to become curious about my teaching. How could all my good intentions have gone badly? How did my identity impact how what I taught was received by my students? What didn't I know? What didn't I know that I didn't know? I became curious about the lives of my students. I stopped relying on the assumptions I had about what the reality was and found ways for students to voice, describe, use, and build from their experiences. I started asking myself what might change if instead of defending my intentions, I accepted responsibility for the outcomes and I moved toward immersion, immersion. Every once in a while, I thought I could start to see something that looked like systemic and institutionalized racism, but then my white privilege would show up and make it invisible again. I spent a lot of time squinting to see what was right in front of me. When I could see it, I felt afraid and daunted by how huge and complex racism is. I had moments of being afraid to speak up for fear of saying the wrong thing, but mostly I feared making things worse. After the murder of Trayvon Martin, a black woman friend asked me what I was going to do to keep her black son safe. This conversation, and others like it, made me realize that my fear of speaking up was not valid in the face of the fear that my friend faces every day for her family. Autonomy still feels aspirational. The more I know, the more I understand how much I don't know. I try to stare at those feelings of superiority that still arrive and to acknowledge them, because the more I try to deny them, the bigger they get. I have been able to take back the parts of myself that I had disassociated from before. And now nothing makes me feel better after a hard day than watching a good British costume drama. I feel better able to feel compassion for white people, even when they frustrate me, including myself. Elizabeth's Story I grew up in Silicon Valley as it was coming into being, and most everyone looked, talked, and sounded like me. I was raised in an Italian and Irish Catholic family, and both sides of my family immigrated to the United States around the turn of the century. I was very aware of my ethnic identity because my grandparents spoke only Italian, and my mom often talked about her grandmother from Ireland but we never talked about being white. And while my hometown was majority white, the surrounding towns were filled with people of color. So I had memories of talking about the race of others, just not my own. But those observations of racial identity were generally made in hushed tones for my parents, a very clear message that I was not to talk about race. I was able to stay in the contact stage for a long time. And any time I encountered what I now know to be racism, I was able to come up with a different logical explanation for why it was not about race. When I first started teaching many years later, I joined a school midway through the year and was asked to take over a literature class that had erupted a few days before I started because of the use of a racial slur in a story by William Faulkner. The previous teacher had been challenged by the African-American students in the class who were tired of reading the N-word in their classes. They had heard the rationale and explanations, and they said they were sick of having to endure the racism in their classes with their predominantly white peers and teachers. I remember thinking, 
Why can't they see the argument for teaching that particular story? Surely we were not racist for teaching it, and Faulkner was simply using the term he had heard. What was the problem, and why were these young people so upset? And then I realized it was the very first conversation I had ever had with African American students on the subject of race. This was a textbook moment from Helms's work, my contact stage moment in which I was still unaware of my whiteness and was asserting my worldview as normal. The following school year, I had a very different experience teaching an ethnic voices class than another school. The class was split evenly along racial lines, eight white students and eight students of color. What I didn't realize was that I tipped the balance. My whiteness counted. The students of color were experiencing many different levels of racism, and I was having a very difficult time managing the class. I was in way over my head. About six weeks into the term, the eight students of color showed up at my desk. They told me they had decided to drop the class, and they were willing to get an F and risk losing college acceptances because the racism they were experiencing was intolerable. Because I had not come to terms with my identity, the class was facing its own crisis. They looked at me intently and asked what I could do. What could I do? I told the students I would find a way to make it better. I asked them to give me two weeks, and they agreed. Then I cried for three days, signaling a shift to the disintegration stage. Suddenly, I was aware that racism had something to do with me, and I was awash in feelings of guilt and shame. Once I realized that I needed to figure out what being a white woman meant for me, I began to look for some narratives that might help my own exploration. Ruth Frankenberg's study of 40 white women significantly impacted my understanding of whiteness. So I wasn't just Elizabeth. I was raced. And that positionality meant something. It affected what and whom I noticed and what I didn't. It was also the beginning of a racial group membership for me. And it was here that I toggled between Helms's reintegration and pseudo-independent stages. I was battling my own feelings of guilt and shame and often was angry that to be white was to be presumed guilty of racism. I was still bristling at the fact that I may be a part of the problem. I was also in the midst of a huge intellectual transformation, consuming every text about race and racism that I could. Another indicator of my status in the pseudo-independence phase was my desire to work only with people of color. I remember being so mad at other white people. I called this my, I'm going to hit you over the head with a frying pan stage. Whack! I was going to make sure every white person understood racism and white privilege. I was done with all the foolishness. I was going to clean up this racism mess once and for all. Now we call this the smartest white person in the room moment, and I was great at it. Perhaps most importantly, it is a space filled with arrogance. I remember thinking, I can't believe people haven't figured out how to end racism yet. The fact that I could now see racism was quickly processed as, what's wrong with the rest of y'all? Here is white supremacy at perhaps one of its most effective moments. Because I now see something, I must have discovered it, and I alone will remedy it. In 2001, I had my first anti-racist white affinity group experience and it helped move me toward the immersion slash immersion phase. Until then, all of the dialogue was in my head, happening as I read books and cited research. To be in a space with other white people talking about our identity was a profound shift that helped me to see how much I had to gain from other white people. I had relied on the stories of people of color to teach me about racism. But this was the first time I could see my role and how I had been carefully reenacting my part in a play, written well before my time. Other white people had felt and noticed the same things as me. I was not unique and special, and together we could be way more effective. Dipping my toe into the autonomy phase helped to clarify why white people need to talk to other white people. I started anti-racist white affinity groups at my school, and every year we had to fight for it to happen. It was the staff of color who supported the white affinity space, often saying, yes, please go talk with your people. It helped me really see racism as a system, not just a dynamic of good and bad white people. Every year, white people would fight the existence of these groups, 
They would argue with vague and nebulous statements, always about this feeling they had, which I now understand was their profound discomfort. They seemed so convinced, and in my head, I started to question the program. That's how white collusion with racism works. White folks are really good at getting other white folks to stay in line and support the status quo and doing it all with a calm tone of voice and positive facial expression. I could start to see how these white colleagues really believed what they were saying. There was no way they were complicit, and their feedback to me was genuine. I could now recognize myself in them, and that empathy helps me have more compassion and resolution. I'm grateful for these fleeting moments of autonomy when I feel like I am part of an anti-racist community where our whiteness can be recognized, interrogated, and used to fight racism and diminish the harm to people of color. I struggle to fight the judgment that can creep in, and I strive to stay as humble as I can while also holding myself and others accountable. As you can see, there are some common threads between our two stories and some unique experiences that have guided our ways into racial awareness. If this were prescriptive, we would all be able to see the clear way forward. But it is not. Ultimately, the work of locating yourself within white identity and how you have been shaped by your race is yours to do and understand. We want to offer encouragement to engage in this process, as we both feel the grounding that comes with a clear reflection of ourselves. There is an ease that comes in not having to tie ourselves into knots to avoid knowing certain things about ourselves. There is encouragement to no longer being paralyzed by shame and guilt. There is comfort in knowing our strengths and in being able to name and nurture the parts of ourselves that need continued growth and support. There is relief in causing less harm to the people of color in our lives. There is joy in defogging the mirror. <laughs>